intelligencesquared.com. Well, there's really two big issues. There's one that we need to realise the extraordinary untapped potential here and around the world of renewables, but also of energy efficiency and reducing demand. Now, the proponents of nuclear love to bleat that renewables are intermittent. But let me say you this, renewables are not just one technology, they are a family of technologies. And when the wind doesn't blow, the chances are the sun will be shining. When the sun doesn't shine, the chances are the waves will be rolling. And when even all that's not happening, the tides will definitely be turning. And even then, you've also got other technologies like renewable heat from ground source heat pumps and many others. You know, it's not just about wind farms as the other side love to portray it. With renewables, uh, the, the argument again is about the, the thermodynamics and the intermittency. But the fact still remains that you cannot guarantee uh, the uh, level of energy security that we have become used to. The fundamental problem with wind is not that it's a brand new technology and we haven't looked at it. It's that over the last 3,000 years, nobody has managed to come up with a way of getting the wind to blow at a constant speed so you can run your wind generators from it. Now, it may be that that's a matter of the international nuclear conspiracy starving funds from uh, wind. I have to say, I personally don't believe that that is the problem uh, here. Uh, and similarly with uh, water power, actually, low wind speeds result in low waves because a lot of wave is whipped up by the wind. In 2003, uh, in the summer then it was, uh, that uh, anticyclone, that's the word, that sat over the whole of northern Europe brought the output of the wind farms down to 1.5% uh, of rated output for a three-week period. Uh, the point that's made, and Malcolm made it very forcefully, is that you have to watch out that... Uh, about renewables because they're intermittent. He didn't bother to tell you that nuclear is quite intermittent. He left out that little bit about the fact that uh, there have been days in recent years, there have been days in Britain when there was no nuclear power operating at all from a combination of planned outages and unplanned outages, as they're called. Actually, nuclear is not available on a planning base, planned basis about 10% of the time and an unplanned basis about another 14% of the time. So, roughly speaking, a quarter of the time the nuclear is not there anyway, and that's rather larger than the intermittence you might get, as Malcolm's numbers, uh, from... Uh, 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 the renewables. Now, I'm not saying that radiation is not risky. As we can see in Japan, things can go badly wrong and the damage and, uh, can cause serious damage to the lives and health of many people. But we need to compare this with other energy sources to get a true sense of the relative risks of nuclear. In 2010, for example, there were 25 major energy-related fatal disasters around the world in, um, in oil, mine, oil refineries, coal mines, and things like that. I bet the only one you probably heard about was the explosion at the uh, Deepwater Horizon drilling rig, which killed 11 workers. Um, did anyone hear about the 91 miners who were killed in a coal explosion in Russia on May the 8th? Or well, the gas explosion in China on the 14th of May, which killed 21? Or well, the oil pipeline explosion on the 19th of December in Mexico, which killed 27? Today, all of these were far more deadly than Fukushima. What this proposition means doesn't matter what the economic risks are. Well, let's look at what those are. I mean, there's a risk, and some people have talked a bit about it, about whether nuclear is more expensive or not when it operates uh, in a uh, normal way. But let's look at the risk that is now, the economic risk now in Japan. Let's not worry about people exposed to radiation. Let's think about 200,000 people who are not going back to their homes. They are not going back. That's not a decision of rabid anti-nuclear environmentalists. That's a decision of a rather aggressively pro-nuclear Japanese government. And that is going to cost somewhere between 100 and 200 billion pounds to the Japanese taxpayer, by the way, because the company that created the problem is uh, bust. So we have to accept that risk. What we've never done, and the real heart of the problem here, is that we've never been in a position to allow us all to feel just how benign radiation is. We evolved into a world which is enormously radioactive, 10,000 bits of radiation through our bodies every second. If the good Lord had come to the British authorities and asked for planning permission to build Cornwall, he'd have been turned down without a second, uh, a second glance. Of course that's going to create concerns. But at the end of the day, 
we have to get back to this reality. If we can't do that, if we can't start treating radiation like other risks, then of course nuclear energy is going to be too expensive. I like Malcolm's uh, ending up there. Uh, radiation is good for you folks. It would be really interesting to see uh, what a challenge that might be to the uh, whole of the advertising industry to come up with a way in which you could uh, actually sell that idea, but maybe it's possible. Uh, I'm not sure I'd like to be in the agency that got the job. From a climate perspective, the greatest risk, I think, is a strategy that relies so much on nuclear power plants. Because the reality is the nuclear industry has consistently over-promised and under-delivered. Do you know, Margaret Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister, promised that she would build 10 nuclear power plants. How many did she do in her reign? One. And actually, we've had a government obsessed with nuclear for the last 30 years or so, 50 years in many respects, with a notable ex exception of about three to four years at the start of the new Labour government. For the rest of that time, the government's been obsessed and pampered nuclear all you like. And yet, we've had one built in the last 20 years. If we rely on nuclear and those nuclear plants don't get built, then we will see a real reliance on coal and gas. And there's the real problem. There are so many reasons, so many reasons why you should reject this motion tonight. But I'll give you a really big one. This is an old technology. This has been around for 50 years and has been pampered like no other technology, like no other industry in the world. So why are we not living in a low carbon future now? Key question to think of there. If this industry has failed to deliver the last low carbon future in the last 50 years, with all the support it's been given, why do we really believe it's going to deliver it in the next 40 years? There are real dangers if we choose nuclear. There are real dangers that we choose nuclear and we get climate change. The 21st century should not be about the old energies, should not be about fossil fuel or nuclear. It should be about the new technologies of tomorrow. In terms of renewables, uh, interesting, the statement that they're new. 3,000 years since the Chinese started using wind uh, for energy. Uh, 2,000 years since the Romans built a whole empire on water power. Um, 50 years for nuclear. I, I have to say I don't particularly uh, understand that uh, strain of the, uh, of the argument. To quote, Nuclear power currently avoids 2.2 to 2.6 billion tonnes of CO2 if that power were instead produced by coal, end quote. Um, and that's, uh, if you mix up coal and gas together, which is probably more realistic, it's about 1.5 billion tonnes. So those who oppose nuclear power would seemingly have us dump um, several additional tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere, which of course is already overloaded with carbon, and they call themselves environmentalists. This is what I don't understand. And actually, Mark, tonight, got pretty close to saying not only were they wrong, but they were also immoral. Well, Mark, let me tell you something. I was the director of Friends of the Earth, and I was the director of the Green Alliance, and I founded E3G, and I've been uh, honoured by the United Nations and by the British government for being an environmentalist. And I resent very much the idea that you wrote in the LA uh, uh, Times that actually you weren't a true environmentalist if you disagreed with your proposition. Well, I disagree with your proposition, but I'm a true environmentalist, and you haven't worked for any environmental organisation leadership role anywhere. So don't tell me I'm not a true environmentalist. I have to say, I mean, I've been talking about this now for nearly two years, three years, and I've sort of got used to it. Um, I mean, the volumes of hate mail that I get from the Greens are far more than the volumes of hate mail I used to get from the climate change deniers, and they say much, many worse things. Uh, I got one yesterday that accused me both of being a convicted bank fraudster and a member of the House of Lords. <laughs> Nuclear competes. It competes with renewables for political attention, for public money, and actually, you know, you need a different type of grid as well. You know, we need to move to much more decentralised energy. And uh, Malcolm said the point that he tried to argue that they 
don't compete, renewables don't compete with nuclear, that's because at the moment the energy market is completely rigged in the favour of nuclear. And the way the government's going with the, uh, their ideas at the moment for energy market reform next year, they're looking to do the same again. Decentralised energy sounds great, but if you couple that with the level of security of supply that I believe people demand, if you really want to get rid of the present coalition government uh, tomorrow, then I'd suggest engineer a power cut overnight, because that's the thing that will get people saying, we can't have this, we've got to have a government that's going to protect our security of supply.